All right, let's get started. Okay, yeah, Mr. John Lockhart's here. Welcome. First person of the stream. Congratulations. You can stick that on your Achievements of Life card or something. Tick it off. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Yamara's here. Welcome. Are you on your 1466? Sam Davis, Robert, Thunder9, Travis, Ed, Stuart Menzies. Um, we're, we're starting out a little more enthusiastic because it's probably just going to go downhill from here. Um, I'm not sure we're going to have success tonight, but I thought I would have another look at it since we've got the sort of fresh, dreary eyes of 10 o'clock at night. And um, the, the way I'm feeling about it at the moment is it's kind of like a U8900 type situation where we may have a fatigued or not quite right joint on one of the... Um, QFP chips, QFP, anyway, uh, DFNs actually, anyway, so, no, not DFN, QFNs, that's it, QFNs, so I'm going to basically go along and redo the joins around them and see if we can get an improvement, hey Jose, a Margarita, Bix Bacon, that's an interesting name, oh Bix Bacon, Stockholms, oh good Yindi Yamar, glad to hear the 1466 is doing its job, Hey David, from Germany, got Morgan, be positive, mm, where's my optimism, optimism sort of got sapped out a bit this week to be honest, it's not been the best week for repairs, um, I've probably, yeah, we've sort of been looking at around about a 50% failure rate or 50% 50, 50 success rate, whereas normally I'm used to hitting around about the 80, sometimes 90. So when you get down to half your jobs dropping dead on you, it does sort of kick you in the guts a bit. And I'm still fighting with the drivers and things like that for the infrared software. I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do about it. Um, if any of you out there are competent with writing USB type drivers, like Win USB in this case, we need to modify Win USB or have an INF file or something like that set up so that it can handle the FLIR 1 Pro composite device. Because um, WinUSB, it, I have been using the, uh, well not me, but the other person I've been having ha assist. Uh, there's a tool, Zaif or something like that. And that's been used, but it doesn't quite make it work yet. So it's a bit of a pain. And that's on Windows. And then there's MacOS, which is in itself a, a whole nother different problem. And I'm using the LibUSB, which should work, but the problem is on the LibUSB to dry, yeah, it's that bit in the middle. That's the problem. Hey, Steve K, and Peter Javansky, hey, Missouri. Still around, still nice and cool over there. Okay, we've got another, you know. Your work pad above the table. Is it a work pad? Can I buy you talking about. Oh, whoops. Just blah, blah, blah. Overhead. You talking about this grey boarded thing? If you're so talking about that, that's just a kitchen silicon mat. That's all it is, it's nothing fancy. Hey Imran. Uh, well, we're, we're trying to be a little bit more positive, but what we'll do, since we've got fresh eyes, I've really got to stop doing rabbit ears to accentuate things, because that's a load of BS, but anyway, since we've got fresh eyes, fresh-ish eyes, we'll have a look under the microscope and see if we can spot anything this time around. Okay, yeah, David, in that case, yeah, it's just, get them on eBay, they're just silicon cooking mats, usually around about 10 bucks or so, regardless of what currency you work in. Hey, Gasman. Okay, so I'm going to use a brush this time to just try and knock away any grains of sand or something, maybe some you know, green is obstructing something. Now, if you're here for the earlier stream, we did have only two locations of 
corrosion. One of them is quite unusual. One of them was actually on pin 2 of the Wi-Fi module, which is this pin here. It's a data pin. And it was very unusual because I couldn't really see anything actually inside there, so I'm not sure how that came about. Hey, Ricardo. And the other one was there. This bit of corrosion here, but that actually should be completely non influential on anything because that's just a basically it's just a big fat ground plane. The only thing I do wonder is what caused these bits of corrosion because that doesn't quite look like atmospheric corrosion, that looks like something else. Yeah, so we've got a bit of a tricky one, that's for sure. So my theory is one of these type of chips has a dud join on it somewhere. Primary culprit could be something like the ISL 69, uh, 659. Otherwise it could be the TPS, this one here. But I guess I'm sort of going to end up going through all of them, trying my luck and seeing what happens. We'll do it one by one, test, try again. We already replaced this here, which is a 3v3 SUS switch, because there was a, a bit of a strange kind of smoke uh, layer on the board around here, but it seems that was not the case, as in it wasn't the fault, but it was particularly unusual to see it. So yeah, it's probably going to end up being a board that I just simply designate to donor parts and replace with a known working board, or at least a board that seems to work a bit better. Hey Michael Kiram, good morning to you. Uh, Stuart, it just yeah, it just drops straight out, and it will happen basically any time from the moment you power it up. It's not particular to any state of running or anything. It just happens, and it is absolute. But it will occasionally try to restart. So I'm really, um, it's, it's a hell of a tricky one. It's one of those ones where you can get lucky and maybe you'll spot the fault just by pure luck. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you, Michael. The two US dollars. Keep the, keep the ice cream fund running. Hey Lewis, morning, A 3 x Might let it shut down and check voltages. We will certainly lose our, um, we're certainly losing our SOs because the chipmunk shuts right up. So that's why I was sort of heading for the ISL as my first culprit. Figuring when I lose that, then you, your whole system will drop down. These are not the sort of faults that you really want to be dealing with. They are frequently the sort of thing that will plague you until eventually you do just replace the board outright. Yeah, you think you can fix it, you send it back to the client, it works for about three months and then boom, it starts doing it again. Sorry. As far as I remember, it did go all the way back to zero. Good on you, mate. 
it doesn't appear as though it's a thermal issue. It's not drawing excessive or anything like that. And it doesn't, if anything, getting hot seems to preserve it maybe a little longer. And that is why I'm starting to think it could be something like a U8900 bad solder. Obviously, there's no U8900 on this. But I'm just using that as an example of the type of behavior that you're seeing, this sort of intermittent failure that isn't really linked with the battery out. Oops, that is not a good thing to do to a screen that's as expensive as that. Anyway, I don't know how long I'll be able to keep this up tonight, but we'll give it a whirl. Just going to put my extension lead in. I mean, as it is, my eyes are blurry as hell already. SMC is certainly a possibility, yes. There could be a crack under there. It's certainly well worth exploring. I guess I would sort of do the QFNs first, simply because it's easier to go around the QFN, solder them up, and then yeah, see if they keep behaving, as opposed to let's just replace the SMC outright and then go, well, that wasn't that. And then you've added potentially a new element of issues, potentially. I feel disorganized at the moment, more than usual. Okay, here we go. Keyboard, ah, I need the alt key. Andrew Hughes and Newsboy UK. Uh, Stuart, hey, why the heck did YouTube... Ah, oh, crap, I mean, hi, damn it. Sorry, Stuart, for some reason that nixed your message. I'm just waiting for it to boot, and I'll probably press the wrong key. Yeah, it's not even looking at the flipping... Okay, that's interesting. The screen actually hasn't energized that I can tell. Yeah, that sucker hasn't energized. It's still got the greenish color on it. But interestingly, it's running at full fan speed. So we're getting closer. When it does that, it's often an SMC. Let's try this again. Although it could be because it's got no keyboard trackpad attached. Uh, well, most of them are. I mean, in the end, it's usually some cap or some resistor or some joint that decided to have a bad day. Under normal circumstances, if I had other things to do in the queue, I would not be touching this. I would just replace the board and get on with the life. This is not how you make a profitable business. If you want to know how to not do a profitable business, just follow what I'm doing. <laughs> 
What I find interesting is that current staying very steady. Oh, now it's moving. Andrew Hughes, um, I haven't, what did you send or is that a surprise? Yes, I do enjoy the challenges. I think, yeah, if you've got an unlimited time and you've got someone paying your bills for you, then, yeah, I mean, by all means, you know, I'll, I don't like to let these things beat me too much. But I also have the opposing situation whereby financial demands will beat me more than what this board will beat me. So I'm somewhat more inclined to handle the financial demands first. Come on, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds, I think before I give you another 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, come on. Hurry up. Show me those Mac boot drive options. Oh, the 3D printed items. Right, no, yes. Uh, nothing's arrived yet. Sorry. Service is a little slow out here. Right, so that booted on its own. It wasn't because of my keyboard pressing, so that's okay. Let me just turn that off. No. <laughs> Whereas if you watch other channels, channels where they've got a backlog of jobs waiting to be done, then you'll see that as soon as something like this comes up, it's yeah, gets tossed to another queue. Usually Paul S's queue or yeah, well that's the usual one you see. But one, I don't have a Paul S handy, and two but at the moment, I don't have anything else in the queue. Evening, Paul Hal. I'd say this is running really slow simply because of the, yes, the lack of keyboard and mouse. Ah, uh, trackpad, rather. It's not connected. I'm just using a wireless keyboard mouse right now. Now we know it's not the chassis because we put this board into a completely separate chassis, which is actually this one here, and it did the same thing. So we can't blame anything other than the main board. At least I hope that's to be true. And it's not the temperatures, because they're all good and fine. What I might try to do is actually twist the board a little bit. Come on, let's do the twist. Maybe I should get some shoe rubber. No, twisting is not doing anything. Bending. Hey, Pedro. All right, next step is the old tap test. You put it under the water tap and drench it. No, just kidding. Sound like a African migratory sparrow swallow drop these coconut ends off for to me. To me. Hey, 
Hey, Draco. Alright, it doesn't seem to be shock sensitive. It doesn't seem to be twist sensitive. Hey, Combat Wombat, I haven't seen you in here for a long time. I mean, obviously, you know, I see you on the Discord, but not actually in here. Bend it in half. <laughs> uh, use a bigger hammer. Yeah, well, I suppose that is actually a legit option, funnily enough. I'll do some more tap dancing again. I'm not tapping very hard, it just sounds louder. Well, that ain't misbehaving. Hmm. The other possibility is maybe it's something to do with the signaling it gets from the trackpad and keyboard potentially maybe it's messing up something there, misinterpreting something because we'll give it another couple of minutes but right now this thing is sprinting along just fine other than the fact that the fans going absolutely bonkers ah. uh, I don't use Furmark uh, this is uh, obviously Valley. Interesting, the fan's running at six and a half thousand RPM, so SMC is definitely confused as to what's going on. Okay, let's try some uh, spot cooling to see if anything happens. This is the kind of testing you used to have to do in the old days when you had sort of like an intermittent problem. You had no board views, rarely had schematics still, and you wanted to find that intermittent problem. And you'd have to go along, use your freeze spray or your hot air, or your soldering iron, and just incrementally go over the board, trying to look for that point where something happens. Do not appear to be temperature sensitive either. At least not on this side. Uh, Andrew, I've already been flexing the board. I'm flexing and twisting. And uh, nothing has happened, which I find quite interesting. Okay, so we're going back top side. Let's see what we can come up with. So remember, we're just trying to get it to just drop out. And usually, a shot of the cold spray will reveal any sort of cracks because it'll make the chip and the joints just shrink, which tends to expose it, whereas the heat uh, expands the things, so they tend to press together tighter.
Let me use up on my free spray. Uh, it definitely doesn't seem to be, well, it certainly doesn't seem to be temperature sensitive. No. Nope. Hey, James Devaney, West London, huh? Even if I'm not as sweary as my counterpart in the new world. No, most certainly not. Hey, GP. Hmm. All right, let's try our theory that maybe it's a signaling issue being created when we're actually connected up to the proper keyboard and trackpad. Now, I'm not saying that it is the keyboard and trackpad, but rather that something's going on with the signaling coming out of the cable being misinterpreted or something, I don't know. Because that, that's been running for a while and we didn't have a failure, which was uh, it's a little bit unusual compared to this morning. The other possibility is the fact that the SMC, because this was probably running in, well, um, what do you call it, uh, default mode or fallback mode, that maybe because it's in fallback mode it's not revealing or not listening to a sensor that could be what's making it shut down. Now, unfortunately, being a 165, we don't have an ASD for that, so which is a bit of a bummer. I have wondered though if I could, with most of the sensors on these MacBooks, surely they're all in the I2C pad, um, I2C list on the bus, so maybe they can be actually detected and tested. I mean, they must be to some degree, because when you bring up Linux and you bring up the temperature sensing and things like that you do get a tremendous number of temperature sensors showing up on MacBook boards but there are a lot of other sensors that you know an ASD test will go through like current sensing wake up sleep cycle all that sort of stuff and none of that is covered in Linux. Yeah, Pernov, that's what I was just saying is that um, it was throttling, yes. It was blowing the fan hard and it was throttling. But I was just wondering whether that's a part of finding out what the cause is for these sudden and complete shutdowns is the fact that the SMC is running in a different state So it could be a case that we do just have a dodgy SMC. Or we have a sensor that's doing unmentionable things to the SMC. Now, pan off. The big problem with that is I, I still don't have it. Someone wants to send me an eight gigabyte um, USB stick image. I'll be more than happy to use it. Hey, John Finn, how's it going? Cold, eh? It's quite perfectly pleasant here in North Queensland. I mean, you can see I'm still just in a polo shirt, a cheap one at that too.
Come on. Boop, 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 boop. Have you tried any component cooler spray to detect a thermal intermittent? Uh, Ron, were you? <laughs> you must have just turned up when I'm finished because, um, yeah, I mean, I just went through a quarter of a can of that stuff. Let's see, Pionov says, I've read about a few cases of shutting down while booting or just after booting with touchpad connected, but not when disconnected. Probably related to power consumption. Okay. Um, no, I'm not going to Ipswich, sorry. I've lived down in Brisbane. I'm not going to Ipswich. Asking the Please Bro channel on Discord for modified. Okay. I will do that, Pionov one day when I remember okay this is booting now so that's why I can't hold the screen down because it uh, the weight balance is wrong I think the coldest I've ever been is in the dead of winter when I was coming back up from the Gold Coast on my motorbike at three o'clock in the morning after I finished a job we were doing a netware migration uh, for a hotel and uh, we finished up at three in the morning I remember we were migrating someone's magic programming language system and that was cold I only had my leather jacket on and for anyone who rides motorbikes will know that even though leather jackets can be extraordinarily hot in summer they don't really provide a lot of uh, protection against the cold in winter Hey, you user. Alright, let's see if this thing crash and burns. I mean, to be fair, these days, hating on Ipswich is more of a, just a, you know, it's just what people do. I'm sure Ipswich is a nicer place now. Especially now that you've turfed out your um, prior counsellors, who are now probably spending some fine time in jail, I believe. Hey, Peter Crystal. And now we wait. We wait to see if something happens. I'm going to be very mad if nothing happens. I used to look after Netware from Marriott and Par Parramatta. That brings back memories. So much better than Active Directory. Hmm. Um, it's jumping all over the place, but I'm not sure if what's going on there. Interesting that it drops as low as in the 300s. That's quite low. John Finn, basically nothing really other than we gave it a twist test, a tap test, a cold spray test, and we haven't had any, we haven't had a failure yet since we've started this stream. Uh, Oliver? It's impressive that it's running only at six and a half watts. Yeah, 350 milliamp. That's not bad for the whole screen. And it's running a solid state drive. A lick test, mm, maybe not yet. You will notice that the first, well, if you remember from the part one, it did take a while before it started its first fault. I wonder if it gets hot and after it's had the first fault it seems to get faster in the happening so we'll cook it up and see what happens. Yeah, Victor Ola. I'm going to do my Chinese practice again tonight. 
It's only about 10 minutes a day, but I'm hoping I'll eventually learn something. Um, Russian Alekhamov, I really just, I mean, Samsung's are my preferred brand, but for just around the house and stuff like that, for just general things that I don't have any critical care for, speed or durability, then I just go for whatever's cheap at the day when I order them at the supplier. And at one point these Kingstons were going for like 29 Australian dollars. They're currently around about 40 Australian dollars. So when they were down at 29, I think I bought about 10 of them. It's just like, well, I'll grab the lot. Frame rate is back to normal. Okay, maybe the lack of the battery is playing a part in this. One thing I did notice is that when I was testing it before, when I had the valley running before, the frame rate was substantially higher than what I would normally anticipate. Whereas the frame rate now is more around the area that I was expecting. So I think I might put the battery in and see what happens. Yeah, unfortunately because of the balance here it's a bit of a pain. Yeah, at the moment we're sitting at 16, 10 to 16 frames per second. Let's see if I can tilt it. It's really not helping. You're not going to get the level of detail. Jeez, Pernov, that's a big jump. 35 euro up from 18. That's like double the price. Woof. We saw around about a 10 to 15 percent jump, but not, not double. Yeah, whatever the problem is, it's complex. All right, still hasn't failed. We're going to put the battery in and see what happens. Now, remember, this is not the original chassis. This is my test chassis. And it has failed in the test chassis. We've already seen that, so we know that it is only the board that's at fault, or at least is the primary fault. For all we know, it could just be a bad ISL, or weird ISL. We've already checked the resistances for the current sense, and they seem fine. Uh, I'm going to use... not that battery. I'm going to use one of my batteries that I know works. Kind of need to. If I could put a screw in there, that will stop it tilting back, and then I can bring the display up a bit better. driver yeah 24 euro is a little more sensible that's pretty much on par with what we've got here why okay that's good enough But certainly when it comes to, say, doing a customer job, if I'm sending a machine, yeah, if I'm doing a hard drive replacement for them or something like that, then it's always the Samsung drive. 
Unless they're going really, really cheap on me, in which case I'll probably put something like a Crucial BX in it. Yes, something like that. But as soon as it gets over 250 gigs, then I switch them over to Samsung's. Hey, Winfield. Yeah, we're still having a nightmare. Hey, Jim. Welcome. These sort of board repairs are certainly the most maddening. And as I was saying before, you know, if you are in business, then this is not the sort of job to do. And this is why you should have a stock of common main boards that you know are working that you can just swap out when you have to. And then you can just put these intermittent boards on the back burner somewhere. Either as uh, donor boards, which, you yeah, know, maybe not. Or as something for someone to do when there's basically nothing else going on. Tonstar, not overly. Uh, heard people say A400s are unreliable, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend them, but I've never had an issue myself. Yeah, what are these? These A400? Yeah, these are A400s. Um, I've probably gone through about 30 to 40 of them and I've only had one fail so what is that three two and a half to three percent failure rate but for the price I don't have a problem like I said they're, they're great for drives that you don't have critical information on you just need something to as a boot drive or as an external data storage or you know for transferring data but certainly if I want at least the perception of um, what do you call it, perception of reliability then yeah I'll get the Evo 860s or whatever one Samsung drive model that I won't get are the QVOs I found them to be quite disappointing I mean I understand that quad level cell uh, technology is obviously going to be slower than TLC or D you know, anything um, less dense than that but the performance for the QVOs was really bad Mainboard SO rail is showing 1.17 amps, which is pretty much matching what's up on the screen. I just noticed something then. The PECI, okay, I've got something here. I don't know if this is legit or what, but the PECISA, whatever the hell that is, is fluctuating between 0 and 54. It just goes zero fifty four. Zero fifty four. We're gonna try and get the camera down to it. I don't know if that's actually gonna be the fault, but it would help if I could even get the damn camera down there. And what also doesn't help is that I have autofocus turned off. So what is PCISA? Pecky SA. Yeah. Well, that's disappointing. I guess I've just never noticed it.
platform environment controller interface system agent. And why would that be jumping up and down like that? And I notice it gets quite hot straight away when I'm running Unigene and our frames per second is back up to what we should expect. I'll see if I can re-enable autofocus on this for the moment and maybe tilt this off to the side. I'll just get myself a spare window here. Alright, hopefully you can actually see that now. Well, the amp should be rising. They are jumping around a fair bit, I will agree with you there, you know, that shouldn't really be going... Then again, does that um, translate to scene changes? See if the amps drop when the scene changes. Because it seems to hold steady about two and a bit while it's in the middle of a scene. And then, yeah... Wrong damn mouse. Okay, so this one here is our current. I mean, overall, it's not dipping down back to this level here. But yeah, we're waiting for it to fail again. It's um, not delivering the goods. Been about five minutes. Hmm. Yeah, I can definitely see that the transitions are happening with the scene drops, uh, scene change. Yeah, every time it changes scene, a second after it comes back, the graph is showing the dip. But we're still waiting for it to fail. Uh, this could be a long wait for a train to nowhere. I've got to find a way of entertaining myself. The initial high amps right at the start, maybe that was it trying to just put some power into the battery. Maybe there was a few 
because the hardware monitor was showing the battery at 96%, but up here we were showing at 100, but that's not a guarantee for anything. This is really annoying if it's cured. It, that's gonna... Yeah, that's gonna suck. It's gonna suck if it was a... I don't know, a... Dirty connector somewhere and just by reconnecting things a couple of times it's come good. Unfortunately, if I can't get it to fail within say by Monday then I'm just gonna have to declare it as um, unfixed or undetermined and send it back and hopefully maybe it is cured but in most cases what happens is you send it back and about two days after or even two minutes after the person gets it it fails again Well, Peter, we were doing it before, that's the problem, and there was actually no real deterministic or no known deterministic cause for it to fail. We had it failing while it was running the load test, we had it failing while it wasn't running the load test, we've had it failing while it was idle, we've had it failing while it was just trying to boot. Um, it's failed in all scenarios so far both in this chassis and in its original chassis. Okay, Victor Oliver, Saishan. Yes, uh, these faults do end up biting you in the bum. Just like saying naughty words. Put it on the bench running this test and set up an alert with a ping drop. But this Usually what I do is I actually leave these cameras on. And so I'm recording everything. So even if I miss it, if I come back in and I see that it's off, then I can just go back through the footage and see what happened. Have you updated to Unigine 2? No, I haven't. I didn't even know it was available. This is just 1.0 basic. And it seems to do the job fine for these sort of machines. Things like 1706 is that they tend to thrash the hell out of the program rather than program thrashing them. Alright, so heat test is obviously not doing it, so let's just quit and see if the cooldown process, because that's how we got it the first time to fail, is we ran the valley test for a bit, shut it down, and we were just chit chatting away, and all of a sudden it dropped off. And if I, like I said, if I can't get it to start failing, then I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe the hammering and freezing sort of remerged the two pieces of solder that weren't quite connected right. Hey, Belskola, welcome. What's the second graph? Um, uh, I'm not sure. You're talking about this one here. That's the wattage power consumed by the various components. Now this is the overall system current being used. And this here is a breakdown of the CPU, the graphics, you know, the memory modules. Up here we've got our voltages, we've got no real, that's PV, uh, PV bus G3 hot up there. And there's a little bit of wavering there, but nothing I wouldn't expect. I sort of, in fact I would expect that, simply because it dips a little bit under high current because of your just normal trace resistances and things like that. The graph up the top are your temperature graphs. This here is your fan RPM. And 
So I'll just give it another couple of minutes. Honestly, if it doesn't fail over, then I'm just going to have to stop the stream and... Yeah. Oh man, bail on me. Drop it on the floor. <laughs> yeah, Lewis, I don't know if I'm quite up to that point where I can do such things. The thing I am concerned about here is that the autofocus didn't really autofocus in my opinion. If you ask me, that does not look like it's auto-focused. Yep, blurry as flippity-doo. Yeah, let's try that again. Maybe it can't get any closer than that. It should be able to. These cameras normally should be able to... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. They've got the ability to go up pretty damn close. Okay, looks like I'm going to have to manually set the focus. Certainly the angle of the screen is not helping, I do agree. Okay, let's just go through the various stop points. Let's say we're going to go 1, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, here we go, try 4. Five, six, try eight. Ooh, that's better. Ten. We can live with that. That's actually livable. Illumination could be a bit high, yeah. There we go. Um, let's see. And you can see my face. I don't like that. Okay, so four, five, six, seven. No. I think around about ten is about the best I can do. Yeah, oh, yummy steak. The, the trouble is that it's a reflection, so it reveals other parts that you don't necessarily want to be revealed, perhaps. 
let's try just on the battery. I don't think it's going to do anything, but okay, we're just running on battery now. Oh. Okay, but was that my crappy battery? Or something else that caused that? Okay. Hmm. I wonder. Could it be something faulty? Again, we're back to the ISL. Um... Uh, could it be a damaged coil or damaged capacitors in generating the PP bus G3 hot output? Let's see if it fires up. Yes, battery was reading 100%. I'm just booting it again. The ISL is certainly becoming a a strong candidate. Now the reason why I haven't just ripped the board out to straight away get into it is because I want to actually prove that it is reproducible so that when we do um, what we think is the repair we can then test it using the test that we found to be able to reproduce the fault and yeah, guarantee that we've solved or at least have a high chance of believing that we've solved it. Whereas if we just quickly jump into it now, did that just drop dead? Yeah, that just dropped dead. Okay, it is doing the same. Okay, let's put the power back in. Let's see if it comes up good. Have you tried scoping the CPU voltage regulator? Nope. No scope here anyway. No scope that can really do any of that. Well, that's crazy that comes up white. Wow. Talk about brightness overload. <laughs> That's way crazy brightness. Yeah, let's see brightness. Yeah, we're not going to do much better than that. <sighs> Current amplifier the battery, current sensors working, driving the battery MOSFETs, blah blah No, Warren, I haven't tried the FLIR at this point. What I'm actually trying to do right now is simply look at the board, uh, the schematic, and reacquaint myself with how I think things should be done. 
how they are being done on this board and then start going from there Ah, no wonder I was getting confused. I had this board view upside down. Uh, pen, I've, I could have sworn it shut down when it was on MagSafe as well before. I really could have sworn it did, but my memory may be faulty, so... Yeah. So I'm just going through the schematic. So you're going to have to put up with the fact that I'm going to be a little bit uh, spaced out for a bit. And I'm just trying to run through my head how this should be working. It did do it on both? Right, okay, thanks. This is another, this is a different battery to the one that the customer has supplied me with. So I'm kind of wondering, is this ripple related or is it sag related or current, excessive current related? Sensors went crazy just before shutdown. Glad you guys can rewind. No, let's pull the thing and see if it drops out. Actually, I'll run the sensors again. So I'm going to pull the cable. But there's also the act of pulling the cable changes everything as well. That's the other trouble. Well, that does seem to be pretty guaranteed. Right. It's a little bit zoomy for my liking. Not to mention that the focus is no good now. And the brightness. Okay. Brightness can come up a bit. More. Too much. Take it back. It's not too much. I gotta write a program to do this for me. Fleer time. I don't think it's a fluid type issue. So yeah, this battery has been a reliable unit, so I'm disinclined to think that it is actually the battery. 
This here is their unit. We're going to put that in. Hey Max, how's it going? Sent you a screenshot. Sensor's going crazy on Discord. Okay, give me a second. Oh, uh, that is the same dip we saw before. Okay, the biggest concern there is definitely a, you know, PP bus G3 hot taking a serious dive. All of it's taken a dive. Current consumption tanks. Which comes first though? Interesting that one of the temperature rails goes berserk. Hmm. So G3 hot takes a dive and then whatever it is 12 volt rail I'm guessing there. CPU is the one that probably takes a dive as well. Yeah. Okay, well I'd say the fact that G3 hot takes the dive is um, we're definitely looking at ISL type scenarios somewhere. Let's just 100% verify it will do it on their battery, which I'm fairly sure it will. And then we'll take the board out. And at this stage, we may just do the blind replacement of the ISL um, and see what happens. At least because we've now put the time in to try and work it out, we actually have a better idea of what we're dealing with. I'd say the temperature sensor probably acted up because it might have lost power first and then just sent erroneous trashy values. Do Max have a problem with fans causing problems on the sensor lines? Not that I'm aware of. Well, in this case, Pianov, I would still probably replace the ISL just out of um, precaution, since that it's a fairly easy chip to replace. And if we still have it, then yeah, we'll go for the SMC replacement. Aren't both heat pipe sensors on the DC inboard? No, as far as I know, there is definitely one on the edge of the board. Where is it? There's definitely one on the edge of the board around here somewhere. Somewhere. Unless I'm thinking of another board. Yeah, I'll look for it later. Maybe I'm thinking of another board. Unfortunately, ASD is not going to help me here because I can't get ASD for this. Okay, pull the line. Wow, is my old battery that bad, is it? Nope. That's interesting, that survived a bit longer that time. Hmm. All right, let's just, we'll do the ISL. It's probably not going to be the fault, but maybe if we're lucky, 
Yeah. So we're still running in very much a no-brain type behavior here. But sort of semi-no-brain as a completely no-brain. No, not a defective battery because we've actually tried multiple different batteries. It was actually one of the very first things that I considered when this machine first turned up. I thought, oh, maybe it's just a battery failure. But unfortunately, subsequent testing revealed that not to be the case. Okay, this is all my stuff. Put that back into the test shelves. I'll try to find that temperature sensor I'm thinking of. I'm probably thinking of the things like the thirty uh forty nine twenty four. I'm fairly sure that's the temperature sensor, but that'll be from the RAM. They usually have this sort of weird um dotted effects here on the top of their case. Yeah, it looks like I'm wrong. I'm thinking of another board. Oh well, anyway, ISL is going to unfortunately be the first victim. Especially as we said before, most likely is not actually the fault, but we're taking the lazy path out for now. some point damn you unfortunately once you break that it's a little bit tricky to get started again and people are going why the heck do you even bother damn it stop pulling Mostly I just hate the fact that when you've got it around here and you're working on the ISL, it gets all melty. Try reheating for replacement? No, I'm just going to go straight for the replace. Oh, the NEC token caps, they were great. They are actually quite a good money maker. I used to get them quite a lot. And it was great because, uh, yeah, the uh, the fault would be very obvious, and it was, you know, a very common model. And so you'd be forever looking for people with those faults, and you'd be like, "Oh, I can fix that. I can fix that." It was definitely a. It was kind of like the modern, uh, sorry, the older. Uh, uh, what was that? Uh, touch disease and TriStar in iPhones. It's one of those kind of faults. Where it was blatant what it is, and once you know how to fix it, it's a really good bread and butter job. And the more you get, the better your profit margins for the day. Hey, Mr. Lemon, how's it going? Oh, 
I never end up replacing the NEC token caps with another one. I just used an array of about 10 or 12 hundred microfarad ceramics. I did a pretty good job. Never had any come back. Now, pen of you know the touch disease was actually not that bad. Once you once you had a couple of runs with it, you know practices, it wasn't too bad. You could do it in about thirty minutes usually. And because it was only one jumper that you had to do, and it was on the outside of the BGA array, it really wasn't that bad. You did need to have the right wire. That was definitely an essential thing. Yeah, if you had big chunky wire, it would always be a nightmare because the wire would push up the chip and ruin everything else. But reballing the reballing the chip and everything else, no, it was pretty good. I'd say probably the biggest mistake a lot of people got caught out with was when they were starting, they didn't clear away the overfill on all the small parts on the other side of the board. So they'd replace the chip, they'd use a bit too much heat, and then all those parts would float off the pads, squeezed up by the overfill. Once it became more competent at it and could do it at a lower temperature and quicker, then you could sort of get away of not clearing away the overfill. But I gotta say, I still actually, <laughs> I still always clear the overfill just as a precaution. I think you'd be fine with phones peeling off, especially things like that. I mean, okay, the new sort of faults that we're seeing, I find the iPhone 7 Audio IC a little bit tricky, only because it does require a much tighter level of control to prevent you upsetting the baseband CPU beneath it. Oh, geez, I'm not even, oh yeah, I'm good. Yep. That was dreadfully put down. Well, I think you'd do fine on phones, pound off. Yeah, you think I should remove that big blob of solder? Maybe. I gotta say, this is definitely a good investment. I should have done it a year ago. But uh, thank you, Wayne, for sending that my way. I think one part I enjoyed a lot with the NEC tokens was just carving it off the board. It was always very satisfying to get the spudger and just drive it underneath and shave off that chip and all the layers. Trying not to breathe in all the little bits that would fly up. Even if you could like cleave it off cleanly, just the act of folding those layers would cause stuff to pop up. And yeah, you really didn't want to be breathing that in. Probably get yourself some nice tantalum poisoning or god knows what. Both heat pipe 2 and heat pipe outgoing. Go to 128 when disconnecting DCC and FCC 3437. This is 165 but okay. But of course it should apply the same anyway. Can't believe it took me so long today to understand why people or well, why that song was called It's All About the Benjamins. I couldn't believe that. 
I guess I'm not American, so I'm not overly familiar with the fact that Mr. Franklin is on the $100 bill. But yeah, I was in a half sleep state, and I was churning over, and I'm going, why are we even, why was the song called that? And then it clicked. I was like, oh. <sighs> Da, 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 da. What else? Nothing. Plug the battery in, put the back plate on, close it up, and give it a test. Yeah, that that's what I was thinking, Pern off. Oops. Good thing there's no spinning hard drive in that one, eh? Good thing it's my own machine. There we go. Why am I not getting... Oh, yeah, because the battery's already been connected. No? Seriously? What's going on here? Oh, uh, this is, um... A little weird. It's not even coming up. What did I miss? That's connected, that's connected. Was that ISL bad? Oh, nothing's coming up. That is not very good. Alrighty, let's try a different ISL. I should have tested that before I stuck it into the machine. Blast. Let's hope we didn't kill the CPU or anything. Like I said, worst case scenario, I do have <coughs> I do have spare boards, but that's I can only guess the ISL is dead. I'm just going to plug this in again. Yeah, that one well and truly fell flat. Yep, yeah, that's definitely not firing up. Okay, take that off, try another one. Orientation is correct. Pins are clear. I don't have any shorts. I'm wearing pants at the moment. Bad ISL, maybe. Either that or we have induced a full failure of whatever was before a partial failure. I mean, look at those solder joints, they're perfect. There was absolutely nothing wrong with that connect, that sort of, uh, that solder job. Even if I am saying so myself. It pulls on it. <laughs> the only thing I can possibly think is that that um, ISL was already soldered on from a prior job onto that board. Oh man, that looks disgusting. I'm not using that one. Yeah, you're hideous as well. I mean, I know they, you can't expect them to be perfect, but 
Uh, is it too much to ask for him to be at least reasonably presentable? Uh, yeah. uh, see, now that's reasonably presentable. So it's not chipped to death or anything like that. Uh, that's an acceptable ISL. Fussy, fussy. Well, yes, I am. Well, if you got enough jobs in your queue, then 25 minute, um, 25 minutes or toss it, is a viable business model. Well, I'm going to check it before I put it in the um, in the chassis again. Yes. again. So I shouldn't have to do the center pad because that's already got the leaded solder. There's enough there. Uh, Peter Jordan, uh, if only it was as simple as doing that. Percussion maintenance. It worked if you're in the happy days. And your name is Fonzie. Shoot. Resistor next to the two caps of the tank is slightly not straight. You mean that one? Yeah. I'm guessing you mean that one. That's not a problem. I think in business, if you've got a deep enough queue, you can do that sort of thing. But, and the nice thing is, if you've got patient enough customers, you can let that deep queue stay there. So that if you ever do get quiet times, you can always, you know, reactivate that, start diving in deeper into that queue. But I typically either declare my stuff as no fix or, you know, it legitimately is a no fix scenario or I um, get it fixed within a day or two. So I don't very often have a deep queue in this scenario. Some could say that's due to the fact that I don't chase enough business, but... I do in general get enough work, but a lot of my work, yeah, not everything is MacBook repairs or electronics repairs, I do have a lot of general IT servicing, businesses in town, and there's a bit of junk on that DC in board, which is making me wonder if that was what was at fault. Yeah, bro, that shouldn't have actually caused anything though. 
because the contacts on these tends to be on the side walls, not at the bottom. It's still not good to have that in there. Got nearly 400 people, seriously? Crikey. It's a little more than usual. Okay, well, we're, we're back up and running. We're either... That current is high, though. Normally, I don't expect it that high. Normally, I expect 350, 400. Yeah. Then again, oh, there we go. Three, yeah, there's our 360. All right. Let's put it back on the board and see what happens. On uh, the chassis, rather. But me. Now I've got flux all over my hand. I hate that. This is my chassis, so don't panic about the fact that I've just put it onto a flux enabled desktop. Well, this is going to be interesting, so are we going to have this fix it, or are we going to be doing an SMC quite likely? Now, I don't mind doing SMCs, but I also don't mind not doing them. So if we don't have to do it, I'll be quite happy about that, thank you very much. Keeping it real, hmm, could be a little bit, um, Unfortunately, a bit overused cliche. I think I'll come up with something else. But then I could end up being a little bit too nerdy. Like Magic Smoke Wizard or something like that, because I'm not really a wizard anyway. Pernov can have the title of Magic Smoke Wizard. Not me, though. Me, on the other hand, my title tends to be Mr. Lose Everything. Like, where did I put the cable? Where did I put my battery? Where did I put this? Where's my glasses? Fixing Max when they're fluxed. That's <laughs> um, it, quite neat. Except I need to get them before they're fluxed. Oh, that's more like it. On the 3209, maybe others, caps for the reset, uh, real time clock reset, and s SRT, system reset, what? Can cause random shutdown, okay. Better not be part three coming up. Yes, um, Paul Daniels, ex Paul Daniels, and Debbie McGee, they held, hold the title of magician, magic, and stuff, but. Yeah. Just put everything in the same spot, easy to find. That's called vertical integration. Or a pile of trash on the floor. Which sadly is a little too common for me. Yeah, Travis, um, I don't know if any of you remember, but I was disassembling a 1706 at one point. This is like two months ago now. So. And I took out the battery screw, which if you work on the 1706s or similar, you'll know is uh, like about a 8mm diameter bronzy. Uh, it's a very unique screw. It's just for the battery. And I took that out and I lost that. And, you know, I only found it about two weeks ago, finally. And I was lucky that I had other 1706s come in. And one of them was one that was going to take a long time. So I was actually able to take its battery screw 
in the hope that I would find the original one that I lost. And I eventually did, and it was uh, way over on the other side of the bench on the floor. So it must have fallen down the back and bounced, and yeah, it, was, um, it was an epic tale, very epic tale of travels. Okay, uh, so basically we know that this, if we disconnect the battery, should fail within a minute or two. And now we wait and see if we've solved or we'll see if we are rendered back to having to do an SMC at nearly midnight, in which case it will probably be part three. I always thought the other Paul Daniels' catchphrase was more of like, um, you'll like this trick, not a lot, but you'll still like it sort of thing. Sort of downplay the impressiveness of his magic. Underplay himself. When I build a PC and the screws falls and my kittens will play for... Oh, great, yeah. <laughs> well, this is holding up. This is definitely holding up. Now what you need to do is you need to keep saying positive things thinking that you've actually fixed it. So that if it does have a fault it's going to reveal itself. So I'm going to say, hey it's fixed. We've solved it. I can now build the customer. Of course if it's a really sneaky fault and it's really one on one with uh, Murphy's Law it's going to wait until I've been paid, I've shipped it, and the customer has paid the business that sent this to me. And then when everything is in a row, all the ducks are lined up, or all the dominoes rather, that's when Murphy will strike and tap the little piece of electronics that is misbehaving over, and it will come all the way back to me. And I'll give up, and I'll refund the business, and the business will refund the customer, and the customer will refund whoever they were doing business for, before. Okay, let's try some valley. Now, because there's going to be people, like if this does turn out to be the ISL, there are going to be people that will say, you should have just changed the ISL right at the start. Why would you waste all this time when it was just the ISL, you know, everybody knows you just change the ISL when you got these sort of weird faults, you just do it anyway. It's kind of like people with iPhones just replacing TriStar. It's like, if your iPhone's got a tumour, replace the TriStar. If your iPhone's crying, replace the TriStar. If your iPhone is catching on fire, replace the TriStar. Yeah. And I mean, you can run business like that at times. You can basically have a checklist of items to replace blindly so you replace the tristar you replace 3v3 yeah, just things like that and so you don't actually have to have techs with any sort of diagnostics capabilities and you kind of hope that just over time they'll develop one anyway but this is me and i prefer not to do that at least by going through this route i learn perhaps a bit more about what's happening underneath of course you can go to bed john Lewis would have changed the ISL in the first 25 minutes. He probably would have. But he also has thousands of MacBooks of experience behind him. I do not. This looks pretty well and truly stable. I am going to plug the MagSafe back in just to try and mix it up, get some disruptions going. Very interesting that the frame rate is so high. What is it about this Mac? Is this like a high frequency one or what? Oh, it's the 8 gigabyte one, that's why. 1.8, 8 gigabyte. This is basically the high end of the MacBook Airs. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, yeah, I mean, I always learn so much when you're here and you're, you know, reflecting, you know, sending me 
me bits and pieces to try. It's, uh, these are the sort of the good streams that come about. The ones where you struggle through things and you manage to come up with solutions and you perhaps learn something, I think. As opposed to the bad streams where I start yelling at people and then rage quit. Okay, John, you have a good sleep. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, well, um, exactly, James. I mean, that's the other half of me, the software. But then again, Penov yells at me with the software enough as it is. Because I'm not really a very clean coder. I tend to code to get the job done. And then I iterate back later to clean up the job. The trouble is, often when you code like that, when you're under a pressure situation and you have to release the software, what will happen is that hack job code tends to get layered by other hack job codes and you never really go back and unearth the dodginess that you buried. And so you, after around about 10 releases or 20 releases, you basically have to rip everything up and do it again. Hey, Doug Maxick. Uh, I'm very convinced that this is good. We'll disconnect the power again and see what happens. I'm sorry about the brightness being a little bit absurd. Let's see if we can wind this back. There we go. Uh, Peter, the reason why I'm not too concerned about, say, running a different program in this situation is because we all were already were able to provably make it fail with what we've got here. And we've done what used to make it fail guaranteed, and it's not doing it. So that was part of why I wanted to, why I was spending the time to find a provable failure point so that then when I do come back to this, I don't have that uncertainty. So now I've got a fairly good certainty that we have resolved it using the tools that we already have here. Uh, looks like someone's Rashida Akram has violated the policies and has been turfed out. Alright, well, I think that's good. We're also we're dropping down on our battery here. Uh, damn you, focus. But that's down to 99. Now, as far as I understand, you have to basically wait till it gets to 95, else it's not going to charge. If you try to, you can plug in the MagSafe at anywhere between yeah, 95 and 100, but the system won't charge when it's in that 5% gap. It's just to prevent it from thrashing the battery too much. Oops, scratch the nose. Do you, what's this? Do you not have an oscilloscope? Tonto, I do have a 10 megahertz handheld one. I just don't use them that much. Uh, there are certainly times when I used to use them when you do um, when you're doing development work and you're trying to debug uh, protocols across the ITC lines or the serial ports and things like that. But for MacBook repairs and things like that, I'm if I'm getting to the point where I need to pull the oscilloscope out, it's probably time for me to walk away from it. Where I would say you can definitely still use an oscilloscope is when you're trying to do a diagnosis for a fault that um, is going to help a lot of other people, like trying to work out your timing diagrams to see what sequence things are happening in, for that sort of research type side of things. But for actual diagnosis, um, yeah. Yeah, the only thing I'd use is maybe to see whether the clocks are running clean. A security nerd? Ah, oh, Deskippy. Now, oh, that's a person I haven't seen for a while. 1398, screen rubber beginning to fa- Oh, no, yeah. No. You, you're talking about it's failing up here, typically, where they just tend to break away. That's from where it folds back down onto the chassis and your finger just naturally picks away at it. 
would be handy to catch things like this. It may be, but then half the problem is you have to know where you're going to put your probes in the first place. That's the other trouble. Uh, does Skippy in that case? No, I've got no real advice for you on that one. That is not... I wouldn't try doing anything with it. I can only see that ending badly. Especially on a 1398, because, you know, what is that? A $900, $1,200 screen? I'd say just like, yeah, shave it down and leave it. Alright, I think we're going to close it up at that. I suppose we have to see if it wakes up. That's a good test. Just wait for the fans to stop spinning and then I'll open it back up. Have you ever tried having a cheat sheet for noobs to try looking at diagnosing boards? I haven't personally, but I know Lewis has produced a fairly comprehensive document that goes through a whole checklist series. I Actually, that's not quite true. On Flexboard View now, I have generated um, diagnosis sequences for things like the checking all your rails or checking for PP bus, um, not PP bus, uh, missing PM sleep S4L, things like that. So I am doing that, so I suppose I kind of lied there. Okay, so that, that's come up good again. Consultation fee or something. <laughs> you could have put that towards a new screen, but thank you very much. That's um, that's going to be four tubs of ice cream, some good kitty cat food, and another brick in the house. Thank you. Do you have as much hate for Apple as Lewis Rossman? Definitely not. I don't think Lewis really has that much hate. I think that's a facade, but it's a very effective one. He hoists up the uh, he hoists up the flag, the banner. And it you know just brings everybody in, so that's um that's good marketing on his side in my opinion. Personally, I find the engineering on the electronics engineering on MacBooks or Apple in general to be superior to other makes, mostly because they have got the money. They definitely do have complete and utter cluster f ups. I will not deny that they definitely do, but overall. Like, if I look at the quality of these board assemblies versus, say, a PC laptop assembly, then I will pick these ones over the PC laptop assemblies almost every single time. Half the problem is that, you know, you're talking about a $1,200 system here. So, yeah, they're able to spend the money on the materials and the parts. Whereas when you look at most PC laptops, they're usually built down to a price, so they cut the corners wherever they can. So no, I'm not a hater of Apple. I ha I use iPhone. I used to be an Android person, but I switched over to iPhone. For when I'm on the field, I take a MacBook. I've got a 1502 that I use all the time. I don't like the more recent MacBooks, except maybe I don't mind the 1932. I know people are going to hate me for that because that's got the T2 in it. But I think at least it was better than, certainly better than 1534. The 1534, I'll say, is definitely a, you know, that's a down vote for me. The butterfly keyboards was definitely a disaster. Uh, they're glad to see they've come back to this, even though it took them forever. I'm not keen on a lot of their business practices. But in terms of actual what their engineers come up with, I'm happy with that. Okay, let's see. We're at 90, I'm waiting for 95% to come up so I can then plug it in and check that it does start the charge run again. And yeah, I mean, as Andrew says, for the most part, you can get the schematics and board views for MacBooks, whereas PC ones, it's like, I mean, uh, even if you do get the one that's supposedly for your laptop or whatever, most of the time it's got things that just don't match up. Uh, it's very frustrating. At least with PCs, uh, yeah, you can often quickly repair things like bad um, on-off buttons, corrosion around the EC. Um, yep, corrosion is usually the quickest thing you can find and deal with on PC laptops. Tonto B, thank you very much for the 10 euro. 
greatly appreciate that. Another brick in the house, not in the wall, but in the house. Uh, I'm going to get fatter on all this ice cream too. Okay, we're at, we're at 95 now. Okay, good. So we can plug this in and it should start charging up to 100% again. I really, I always appreciate the contributions. Uh, there was discussion, there has been people who have asked also why I don't do things like Patreon and uh, memberships and all that. And you know, for some people that's a perfectly good option and I don't have a problem asking me why I don't do that. Primarily it comes down to the fact that I cannot depend on myself to stick to a schedule or produce what someone is expecting me to produce. When I do things like I do currently, people are attending or contributing on the basis of what I have already done. But when you switch over to things like memberships and Patreon, they are paying you for what you're going to do. At least that's the general perception. Whether it's true or not, doesn't really matter. But the problem is that, at least for me, it's as bad as giving me the money for a job before I've done it. It just completely sucks the enthusiasm out of it. So, yeah. As a defense against my own bad behavior, that's why I won't do Patreon or membership. So, there you go. There's your answer. If you want to do contributions and if you are a business and you do board repairs, then certainly purchasing a copy of Flexboard View is one of the best ways to help me uh, to rather sort of contribute. And the nice thing is, you know, having Flexboard View will save you time, which saves you money and save your hair too, because you won't be pulling it out trying to. Uh, trying to cut paste back and forth between board view and the schematic. Okay, let's see if we're just going to wait, see if the percentage comes up. We're charging at around about 600 milliamp, I would say, which is probably about right for this state of charge. Once you get up to over 95%, you really don't want to charge lithiums too quickly. Buy ice cream that's made with xanthagum. I've had um, I've had xanthan gum, I think, in um, raspberry coolie. I didn't mind it. Either that or it was agar. I can't remember. I uh, certainly yes. Uh, yeah. Obviously. It feels weird to talk about money contributions and how to maximize things, but certainly PayPal is instant and I get either full or I get 98%, something like that. YouTube is uh, one to two months, depending on how it aligns with their cutoffs. And I get about, I think YouTube standard is about 66% or 60%, maybe 70% of the contribution. But it's all good, really. Um, we're not trying to get picky here. Yeah. Come on, bring up. I hope it didn't have to wait till six, uh, ninety-four percent. That would suck. We're just waiting for ninety-six. Come on, man, you can do it. There we go. Ninety-six just showed up, and that is my crazy fume extractor there. There we go. Thank you, Optimize and Andrew Hughes for that, for the flex board view. Let's see, Steve K. Is it normal for power to fluctuate so much while the charger is plugged in? It does seem to be. I think it just goes. What is that noise? It was a very weird noise. I don't know what that was. Joy of being partially deaf is that I cannot discriminate a lot of noises. I have to rely on my wife extensively to work out what's going on around the house at times. It's um, it's a little bit of a distressing issue. 
particularly when you're trying to monitor your fur babies. You, know, you hear things and you're not sure what you're hearing. And then so I've got to go find my wife and say, can you hear that? But if it is something serious, she, she usually finds me first. And then it's a case of all hands on deck, grab the torches, go outside, find out what's going on, and uh, go from there. Yes, uh, sorry, what I was saying before with the current, it will tend to do that, I think, as it just goes through checking various things, maybe different processes it's, uh, it's got scheduled in background, maybe a bit of uh, reorganization of the file system. So yeah, it seems to be sitting on 1.2 now, and we're up to 97, so we're good. We're, on, we're fixed, definitely fixed. Hey James, great to watch live once. Unfortunately I'm about to no longer be live on stream anyway. My job in the NHS needs my attention now. Ah, alright, well, good luck with it. Keep safe too. Just briefly to summarise what was done on this MacBook, yeah, to fix it up and stop the powering off. Shane Russell, there was predominantly a lot of attempting to provably make it fail and we found that by just disconnecting the MagSafe that would cause it. We eliminated other variables by putting only the main board into a completely different chassis and we found we could still make it fail. So at least at that point we knew that we were dealing with a main board fault. We tried percussive fault, um, mechanical fault, um, trying to bring it out by twisting it and tapping it, that didn't work. We tried using temperature variations by running to get it hot or then free spraying it, that didn't work. <coughs> Pardon me, so we knew we were dealing with something a little bit trickier than normal. And in the end, we basically after we sort of compartmentalized what we thought was the fault, we took the gamble and said, well, the easiest thing we can replace at this point, which could create these sort of problems, is the ISL chip. And we replaced the ISL chip. It failed the first time because I don't know it was a dud ISL or I broke it or something, I don't know. We put a new ISL on and it's worked ever since, so we seem to be good. Let's see, Adam ha Hamza, I'm sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly. Trouble taking out the back of my MacBook 2010 because the battery exploded. The screws aren't coming out. 2010. Uh, I think it, you should be able to get those screws out. Yeah. Are you un unable to get the back plate off or are you unable to get the battery out? How to earn money in PayPal account. Get lots of people to send you money to your PayPal account. So what do you do with these fixer uppers? Private sale or do you have someone that sells them to you? Uh, in this case, this is not going to be a fixer up. This is actually a job. This is a business job. So it's going to go back to the store that sent it to me. On the other hand, if it got to the scenario where it was a board replacement, because I say couldn't solve this, then I would you know, put the board aside over a period of months or maybe even a year I'd try and fix it and if I could fix it then I would use it as a new replacement board for the next time that a job came in that was taking too long and I just wanted to get it out the door um, if it couldn't be fixed then I'd just become a donor part bet you it was that piece of fluff on the DC ha <laughs> yeah I really hope it wasn't I'm fairly sure it wasn't because of the fact that we've had the fault on both I mean, the ISL had to be what was um, at fault. If you can't get the back plate off, uh, I'm a little disinclined to say this, but maybe it's actually stuck in terms of it's got goo in there or something like that. I would see if you can at least lever up some of the corners to get some lift. It may be just that it's bonded to some of the plastic. That's my guess. Uh, If you can't get the screws out, that's all the more fun, yeah. You may have to push down around the screw for a little bit just to relieve the pressure off the head. If you've already stripped the screws out, you may have to yeah, drill the heads off. But that's not going to be any fun. 
Alright, that's it. I think I am done. It is you know, 10 past midnight. Time for me to go get ice cream. Tonight I'm having vanilla ice cream with uh, ganache on top. I'm going to have to do the ganache myself unless I can convince my wife to do it. The way I can do that is sometimes say to her, oh, do you want ice cream and chocolate ganache? And she, if I'm really lucky, will say, I'll do it. And I'll be like, oh, really? And she'll go, yeah, you've been working all night. And I'll be like, okay. And I'll sit down and watch TV while she does all the hard work. So <laughs> I'm probably never going to get that ever again now. And I'm probably going to get yelled at because she probably watches these streams while I'm doing them. Oh, well, it was nice knowing you. See you at my funeral. I'll catch us later.